fucking son of a bitch. What? Easy. You talk to me like that in front of my son? Yeah. Fuck you and your family. Today, we're taking a close look at the life of the sole offspring of the infamous American outlaw, Al Capone. Born on the cold winter day of December 14, 1918, in the heart of Brooklyn, New York, Albert Francis Capone, commonly known as Sonny Capone, was the child of May Josephine Coughlin, the steadfast wife of Al Capone. While Sonny would go on to wrestle with the weight of his father's last name and attempt to distance himself from his father's infamous reputation, he would spend his life battling a bad rap in even some of his best friends. After being arrested for theft, he would famously be quoted saying, everybody has a little larceny in them, proving that no matter how hard you try, you can take the kid out of the criminal family, but you can't take the criminal family out of the kid. Let's take a closer look at Sonny Capone's adult life and his attempts to forge his own path. Early life and education. Sonny's life was fraught with challenges from the start. The enigma of his parentage cast doubt and speculation, with rumors swirling about both his mother and father contracting syphilis. This beguiling question loomed. Was Al Capone actually Sonny's biological father, and was Sonny himself afflicted by this treacherous disease? But amidst the uncertainties, one thing was unwavering, Al Capone's love for Sonny. Regardless of the truth behind their biological connection, Al Capone cherished Sonny as his own flesh and blood, declaring his deep affection by saying, I love that kid. Determined to provide Sonny with the best care, good old Al went to extraordinary lengths. When faced with Sonny's crippling mastoid infection, Al sought a renowned specialist in New York City, generously offering $100,000 for his son's treatment. Thanks to Al's intervention, Sonny's hearing was partially restored, a testament to a father's unwavering devotion. Although Sonny grew up surrounded by his father's shadowy world of organized crime, he was guided down a different path. Encouraged to pursue a life outside the underworld, Sonny attended prestigious institutions like St. Patrick's School in Miami Beach, Florida. It was there that he formed a close bond with a classmate who would later become a television icon, Desi Arnaz, the brilliant mind behind I Love Lucy and Desilu Productions. But stay tuned to the end to see how this part of Sonny's story takes an unexpected twist and sparks fly when Sonny and Desi would cross paths again in a court of law. In a remarkable turn of events, Sonny Capone not only earned his college degree in 1941, but also managed to squeeze in a wedding celebration alongside his cap and gown. Diane Ruth Casey, his fellow Miami Beach High adventurer and sweetheart, stood by his side as they exchanged vows in a grand ceremony at St. Patrick's Church. The young lovebirds embarked on a roller coaster journey of marriage, raising a brood of four lively daughters. However, as fate would have it, the road became rocky and the curtain closed on their matrimonial stage. Undeterred by the perils of heartbreak, Sonny tried his hand at the sacred institution of marriage for a second and third time. It was in his third attempt that he found solace in the arms of a captivating woman named America Amy Francis. The elusive nature of Sonny Capone's personal life, coupled with his desire to distance himself from the shadows of his infamous family name, has rendered public information about his marriages, children, and grandchildren rather scarce. One can't help but imagine the untold stories and hidden chapters that reside within the sprawling branches of the Capone family tree. Various Careers In the colorful tapestry of Albert Francis Capone's life, also known as the enigmatic Sonny Capone, it's clear that he dabbled in more professions than a sugared up kid in a candy store. This part of his story begins when Sonny was a used car salesman only to have an eye-opening revelation that his boss, Mr. Shady McShadester, had a penchant for fiddling with odometers. Well, Sonny, a paragon of integrity, promptly slammed the brakes on that gig. He then went to work as an apprentice printer, leaving a decidedly different mark than his dad on the world of ink and paper. From there, he shifted gears to become a tire distributor. Talk about a man of many talents, right? You won't be surprised then to know that for his last known gig, Sonny donned his chef's hat and partnered up with his dear mother to run a restaurant in the sunny paradise of Miami. A feast for the taste buds and a testament to the resilience of the Capone name, I'm sure. Through each venture, Sonny Capone continued to try to untether himself from the notorious family moniker, forging his own path and leaving behind the shadows of his father's legacy. Yet, like a magnet to metal, Sonny simply couldn't escape handcuffs and courtroom drama. Stay tuned to find out how he would end up behind bars, under investigation by the FBI, and even getting a little shade from the U.S. Secret Service. Sonny's relationship with his dad, Al Capone. 
Despite his best efforts to outrun the shadow of his notorious surname, Sonny Capone couldn't escape the bond he shared with his criminal father, as illustrated by a heartfelt letter penned by the one and only Al Capone himself. This three-page treasure of a letter, lovingly addressed to Sonny Capone, serves as a testament to Al's unwavering affection and loving fatherly advice. He urges Sonny to keep his spirits up, as if personal pep talks were standard prison fare. But that's not all. The proud gangster flaunts his musical prowess, revealing his mastery of the mandala and tenor banjo. One can only imagine the symphonies that serenaded those prison walls. This tender epistle from Papa Capone was sold to the highest bidder from Chicago at a Massachusetts auction for a jaw-dropping $62,500. And who was this mysterious collector hiding in the Windy City? Well, their identity remains as concealed as a mob secret, adding an air of intrigue to this already fascinating narrative. Still, the letter paints a portrait of a father's love and dares to show a violent villain's vulnerability. A Day with Desi, in court. While Sonny Capone did his best to avoid following his father's lawless footsteps, fate seemed to have a different plan for him. Eventually, he would find himself face to face with the long arm of the law, and to make things even more interesting, he ended up in court alongside his old buddy Desi Arnaz. Sonny couldn't contain his outrage when Desi's production company, Desilu Productions, portrayed his father in what he considered a less than flattering light on the infamous TV series The Untouchables, an immensely popular television show that aired from 1959 to 1963, chronicling the heroic efforts of Elliot Ness, a law enforcement agent taking on organized crime in the booze-soaked streets of Prohibition-era Chicago. Sounds like the makings of more great videos for this channel, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. May and Sonny Capone, not taking these matters lightly, decided to take action against Desilu Productions. They filed a multi-million dollar lawsuit claiming libel and unfair use of image. They argued that their innocent grandchildren were suffering the consequences of the show's portrayal of Al Capone, facing bullying and all sorts of unsavory encounters. Yet, their quest for justice hit a brick wall as the District Court, the Chicago Circuit Court, and even the Supreme Court ruled against them, and Desilu Productions continued to produce and air the untouchables, undeterred by legal backlash. Tough luck, Capones. Sonny's other struggles with the law Sonny seemed to be developing a knack for getting entangled with the law. Just when you thought his legal troubles were over, in 1965 he found himself in hot water. Now accused of pilfering two bottles of aspirin and a pack of batteries from the quick check market in North Miami Beach. Now his criminal proclivities are pretty much becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It's hard to say, but one thing's for sure, his sticky fingers didn't go unnoticed. It's a shame, really, with his family background and his supposed desperation to evade infamy rather than the law, you'd think he'd learn to keep his hands to himself. Never one to shy away from a clever quip, Sonny had a snappy response ready when he was apprehended. According to reports, he nonchalantly declared, everybody has a little larceny in them. He pleaded no contest to the shoplifting charge and was handed a punishment befitting his light felony, two years of probation. It's almost comical to think of the son of a notorious mobster being confined to the straight and narrow path of probation, but it seems even the criminal gene can have its limitations. In a dramatic twist, Sonny Capone decided that a name change was in order. Sick and tired of the baggage that came with the Capone moniker, he embraced a new identity as Albert Francis Brown. He was truly desperate to distance himself from the notorious family name and carve out his own humble corner of existence. You have to admire his determination to forge his own path, even if it meant swapping one infamous name for a slightly less infamous one. However, as they say, a leopard can't change its spots, or in this case, a Capone can't fully shed the shadow of his heritage. In 1968, Sonny Capone, now going by Albert Francis Brown, found himself caught up in yet another scandal. He was overheard making threats against the life of Senator Ted Kennedy, just three weeks after his brother, Senator Robert Kennedy, had been tragically assassinated. It's safe to say that Sonny had a flair for bad timing and questionable appropriateness. The incident occurred during a phone call from a public payphone at the New England Oyster House, where he ominously stated, if Edward Kennedy keeps fooling around, he's gonna get it too. You can't help but wonder what was Sonny thinking, making such bold threats over a payphone? Did he expect the mob to deliver a sternly worded message to the senator via carrier pigeon? In any case, the witnesses wasted no time reporting the threat to the FBI, who duly passed the information along to the Secret Service and the local police. 
Thankfully, no actual harm befell Ted Kennedy, though Sonny's ill-advised words certainly raised eyebrows and fueled the ongoing theories of mob involvement in JFK's assassination. So, it turns out a name change can't erase one's true nature or prevent a penchant for mischief. Sonny Capone, or should I say Albert Francis Brown, left behind a legacy of legal entanglements and questionable decisions, but through it all, one thing remains certain. The Capone family sure knew how to generate headlines and keep people on the edge of their seats long after Al Capone himself had left the stage. Sonny Capone went on to live an unremarkable and lawful life, and no further threats or incidents of this nature involving him have been reported. Albert Francis Capone, aka Sonny Capone, aka Albert Francis Brown, passed away on July 8, 2004 in Auburn Lake Trails, California. His wife, America Amy Francis, emphasized that he was much more than his family name and deserved to rest in peace.